Hi, everyone, and welcome to the week on amphetamines. So this is chapter seven. So um, last week we talked about cocaine and now we're going to talk about amphetamines. And what you will notice is that um, they are very, very similar to the things we talked about in the cocaine chapter. Again, we're talking about amphetamines are a powerful central nervous system stimulant drug. But the interesting thing about this chapter is that um, there's widespread therapeutic use of amphetamines to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as well as amphetamines used recreationally. So um, I, I will talk a little bit about the treatment of ADHD, ADHD in this chapter. Um, the other thing that's a little bit different here from comparing to cocaine is that amphetamines are synthetic. They're made in the lab. Um, and they don't come from a plant source. So that's another difference. <clears throat> so first of all, therapeutic use. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, is um, widespread and um, affects many children, adolescents and adults. And um, drugs such as Adderall are amphetamine salts and drugs such as Ritalin, a methylphenidate are used effectively to treat ADHD symptoms. So um, the symptoms of having inability to focus your attention, um, hyperactivity, when these medications are taken, um, there is significant improvement very quickly actually um, in improvement of focus and decrease of that hyperactivity. Um, amphetamines are also used to treat other medical conditions. Narcolepsy is one where there's excessive sleepiness and then morbid, morbid obesity is another one where amphetamines are used. Um, in the past, so several decades ago, it was much more common for individuals to use amphetamines to treat obesity. But now um, that we know that there's some real negative side effects of taking amphetamines, it's more, um, much more limited. Other things are used to, to help people who are struggling with obesity. Illicit use, amphetamines um, sometimes very often are produced legitimately for medical reasons and then they get diverted. So someone who is taking a prescription medication but it's not their own prescription medication or they're using a prescription medication in a way that is not the way the medication is intended to be used, maybe higher doses or um, some other way that is not in, in initial intention, that diversion is um, a significant concern. And then um, amphetamines are also produced by oftentimes small labs for um, recreational uh, use and abuse. There are two forms of amphetamines, um, stereoisomers. There's D-amphetamine and that is the form that has the greater high, the greater euphoric effects. Um, then there's L-amphetamine that oftentimes has greater cardiovascular effects. So a mixture of these two is often um, called the racemic mixture that contains both. And so um, just to keep that in mind. Also, you have methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is <clears throat> structurally similar to amphetamine, but more potent. It produces a real intense high and then a real intense crash. So if you remember back from the cocaine chapter, um, you feel really great when you're using cocaine and then when it um, is out of the system, you feel very depressed. Well, the same thing is true here. You know, the person feels very, very high and then very, very intense crash or depression as soon as the, the drug starts to leave the system. Um, there are also two versions or stereoisomers for methamphetamine, D and L again. D amphetamine, uh, methamphetamine is the more potent um, releaser of dopamine. So if you find methamphetamine um, on the street or the police um, sees methamphetamine on the street, it's more often the D-methamphetamine version. It can be found in powder, pill form, or crystal form. And I think I put a picture of the crystal um, meth form on the first slide. Then you also have cathinones um, that we cover in this chapter. Um, some of them is called bath salts. Um, they have nothing to do with baths. <laughs> but anyways, um, they are synthetic amphetamine-like chemicals. Um, they do occur in nature in the leaves of the cat plant. So um, uh, there are um, cases in, for example, the Middle East where people 
Chu Gat, as it's called. It sounds like it's actually a G Gat. Um, and the chewing of the leaves is a mildly stimulating, um, less uh, dangerous. This is like chewing the cocoa leaves off of the cocoa plant that we talked about in the last lecture. Cathinones um, synthetically produced are, are, are often um, more, more potent, more dangerous. Um, they can cause serious health problems, toxicity, erratic behavior. So this broad category of amphetamines, the routes of administration differ. It can be oral or intranasal, smoking or inhalation or injection. And um, obviously if you're treating some, somebody for a medical disorder like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it makes sense to administer in a slow, safe fashion like oral administration. Um, individuals who inject or inhale um, or use intranasal are more likely to develop um, abuse and dependence problems because the drug is reaching the brain much faster. So in the United States, um, amphetamine and methamphetamine are considered Schedule II. They do have some medical uses, as I mentioned before, like um, the treatment of um, ADHD or morbid obesity or narcolepsy. Bath salts, those cathinones are Schedule I, no medical uses for those. So if you think about the acute effects, it depends on what situation you're talking about. So first of all, the therapeutic situation, you have a child with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. If you give the medication to the child who has attention deficit disorder and um, you look at the behavior within 30 to 60 minutes, you'll probably notice improvements in attention span and um, decreased hyperactivity. Um, the ability to pay attention, stay focused, control behavior is um, kind of fascinating to people because it seems so paradoxical. Um, you think, oh, I'm giving a child who's hyperactive and has an inability to sit still a stimulant. But if you think about it, the small doses that you're giving, the, the small amounts of doses are affecting the prefrontal cortex. And that's part of the brain that a child with ADHD has underactivity in. So it's, you're giving a stimulant to the part of the brain that isn't quite working the way it should. And so that little bit of stimulant helps that prefrontal cortex, that frontal cortex of the brain. And that's what helps the, the child or the adolescent or the adult with ADHD um, focus better. You, you can see this immediately. You, you only need one dose to see these changes. And it's kind of fascinating because if you do brain imaging, you can see immediately changes in those areas of the brain. So um, uh, very effective um, immediate outcomes when treating therapeutically in this way. Now, not every use of amphetamines is therapeutic. Sometimes people are using it for illicit reasons. So again, it could be those diverted prescription medications or it could be recreational use. At lower, lower doses, um, even if the medication is um, redirected from a prescription, um, individuals will report feeling increased attention and focus, increased self-control and, and um, there's also health risks. And as the dose goes higher, then you have more significant acute effects, things like um, greater alertness and arousal, but impairments in accuracy. So you might be able to do things quickly, but sloppily. You remember that from the cocaine chapter that we saw the same thing in the cocaine chapter in this human subject studies. Um, repetitive behaviors, doing things over and over again, having an inability to sit still, increased motor activity or pacing. You can see this in humans or animals. So if you give humans that can't sit still, if you give animals, they'll, they'll be um, pacing around in their cage, in their home cage or something like that. And so um, it's a stimulant and it's stimulating the whole part of the brain as the dose goes higher. So um, same thing as we saw with cocaine, it's going to induce that fight or flight response. It's going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. So you see the same things. Um, especially if the doses are higher, increased heart rate, respiration, blood pressure, but body temperature, um, 
subjectively individuals will report feeling high and alert and sociable and talkative and grandiose and, and maybe excessively nervous or anxious as the stimulant is making them feel sort of that anxiety. They may crave the drug. Um, these are the same things we saw in the cocaine chapter acting very similarly. And same as the cocaine chapter, but even more pronounced, especially with methamphetamine, individuals will often exhibit over time with especially repeated use stimulant psychosis. Um, that paranoia, hostility, hallucinations, delusions, um, the formication syndrome where they think there are bugs on their skin, um, that, that will be here as well. And um, a lot of times, and this was first noticed by police officers, that the individuals who use methamphetamine repeatedly, they seem to age in, in rapid fashion. So it's like their aging has been stimulated. Um, part of it has to do with the fact that they're not taking care of themselves. Then they are picking at their skin because they feel like there's bugs there. And then um, there's dental issues with their teeth. And so um, if you start losing teeth, it, it really ages your appearance. Teeth are so important to your appearance. And so, um, you know, individuals start losing teeth. Um, and so um, that's just one of many things that leads to this rapid aging appearance. So it's very devastating um, for individuals who, who have um, dependence issues. Uh, acute effects also can be very toxic. Again, just like we saw in the previous chapter with the stimulant psychosis, you know, that can lead to aggressive behavior, suicidal, hom homicidal tendencies. Um, the person is in this fight state. And so they can get into trouble by hurting other people or themselves. And so you do have lots of incidences of fatalities um, from things like accidents or suicides or homicides. Now, just to pull together the, the last chapter in this one, just a quick comparison. Amphetamines and cocaine are very similar. They act in very similar ways. There's very similar things that you see with them, like the stimulant psychosis uh, that I just mentioned. Some of the differences, methamphetamine lasts longer, has a longer duration of action. So if you remember from the cocaine chapter, the cocaine is in and out of the body fairly quickly. Um, methamphetamine can last for many, many hours. Um, so because of that long duration of action, methamphetamine is more likely to cause the stimulant psychosis. Um, other things that are a little bit different, cocaine comes from a plant, whereas um, amphetamines are made in a lab. Cocaine is more likely to induce seizures and cocaine can be used as a local anesthetic. Um, now chronically, oftentimes people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are using therapeutically ADHD medications for, for years. Um, what do we know long-term about that therapeutic use? You see benefits for sure. Children have better grades if they're paying attention in school, that's not surprising, right? They're, they're able to focus, they're able to stay on task. They tend to have better relationships. Um, being able to wait your turn makes you more liked by your peers. Um, if you're very impulsive and, and um, you know, not waiting your turn, you know, that that is challenging. So family relationships, peer relationships tend to be much better for children who are treated with ADHD medication when they need it. They're better at driving. Um, but there's some adverse things that we have to watch for. First of all, it does tend to decrease appetite, their amphetamines. And so you have to watch for the weight loss and, and not staying on the growth chart. So children should be growing at a certain pace and sometimes you don't see that. So you might need a drug holiday, which is maybe taking the summer off and allowing the, the growth to catch up and then maybe starting the ADHD medication once school's back in session, things like that. Chronically, when people use illicitly, they're using much higher doses and then there's the stimulant psychosis, there's um, the severe tooth decay that you see with um, methamphetamine use. Um, there's bruxism as well, teeth grinding. It also ruins the jaw and the teeth. Um, 
you can see some neurotoxicity. There's some um, neuroinflammation and, and damage to some of the dopamine and serotonin neurons in the brain that makes it very difficult for someone who stops using methamphetamine to, to sort of recover normal um, emotional states. They feel very depressed for, for many, many months. Um, and part of it is because then they have deficient um, uh, serotonin and dopamine levels. And so um, also uh, deficits in memory and executive fun functioning, that planning, problem solving, um, those seem to be chronic problems. They probably also were a little bit pre-existing in some cases, but then the drug use made it um, worse. So amphetamines are acting um, like cocaine acted in the brain. There's, um, amphetamines are structurally similar to dopamine. All are going to increase dopamine levels in the brain. Different types of amphetamines have different effects on, on different neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Um, so uh, whereas um, cocaine just sort of has that one action, um, amphetamines oftentimes do a couple of different things like they might increase the release of dopamine and block reuptake and block enzyme breakdown and um, mimic dopamine. And, and so this all contributes to that long duration of action in the brain. Um, at low doses of amphetamines used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, as I mentioned before, you tend to see very localized effects in the prefrontal cortex, where that increases dopamine there in that location and norepinephrine maybe in the prefrontal cortex, but not all over the whole brain. But once you increase the dose, if you get high um, doses, then you see widespread action. So if you have to use um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder medications, a treatment plan should not just be the medication. What the literature has found is that treatment plans should be multifaceted. Um, you want to have pharmacological treatment, but then also behavioral interventions. And it may be something as simple as making sure that the child is sitting at the front of the classroom close to the teacher so the child doesn't get distracted. Um, there's also parent training. Um, children with um, ADHD tend to have challenges and it helps to train the parents on effective strategies. We all can use effective strategies to be better parents. So, um, you know, it, it, it makes sense that if you have a challenge with um, extra challenges with a child that you would want help as a parent. You want to be concerned about that drug diversion. So those medications can't go anywhere to anyone else and they can't be misused. So you need to address that. Um, ADHD sometimes resolves in adulthood and sometimes not. So um, a lot of times it does resolve. So you kind of wanna watch to make sure that maybe you don't need the medication after a certain period of time. You know, Maybe the brain was a little bit behind in development and it finally caught up. And so if that's the case, you know, you need to, to assess it repeatedly over time to make sure that the medication is still appropriate. For um, illicit users, users who aren't supposed to be using amphetamines, right now, just like cocaine, there's no treatments, no medications that we can use right now to directly treat the abuse. So um, we're, we're often left with the treatment of, um, of someone who's really deeply depressed which all stimulant users, when they stop using, are deeply depressed, may be treating with antidepressants. Vaccines are being investigated, which is sort of promising. Um, mo there are effective behavioral treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, contingency management, where you may pay a person to not use. Those contingency management studies are extremely promising. Um, you give incentives for staying abstinent and users will be responsive to that. Um, and then um, there's this matrix model, which is an approach that has multiple aspects to it, like the behavioral therapy, counseling, a 12-step program, repeated drug testing to make sure they're doing okay, and then family education. And so um, different strategies, but again, it would be great to have a medication to help users of amphetamines. And that's it.